Well, first of all, I want to say hello and welcome to our Gander uh, brothers and sisters who are watching this via video. We're so glad you're with us. And also to anyone who may be watching this via the internet, welcome to you as well. So today we are wrapping up our message series. It's hard to believe that this is the ninth message in this series that we began. It seems like we had so much time, but now we're heading into Christmas. And so today's message is the last of our uh, series called Stories Jesus Told from the book of Luke. So we have been walking through nine of the parables found in the Gospel of Luke. And we've really tried to imagine ourselves as part of the crowd in that first century Middle Eastern context. We've attempted to take off our 21st century Western lenses, our glasses, and see instead through the eyes of the first century audience what cultural assumptions were being made that we wouldn't otherwise understand. And I found it extremely interesting. Um, and this has made our series so much more meaningful as we perhaps understood these parables from a different perspective. And once again, I want to acknowledge uh, the scholarship of Kenneth E. Bailey, whose commentaries I've relied on uh, during this series. They've been great resources. So today we're looking at the final parable, uh, which is referred to in my Bible as the rich man in the kingdom of God, but it's also referred to as the camel and the needle. And you can get ready to read along with me by turning to Luke chapter 18. We're going to be covering verses 18 to 30 today. But before we dive in, let's remind ourselves what's been going on leading up to this parable. These stories that Jesus told, he was telling them while he was on his journey to Jerusalem. Some call these stories the travel narratives. But Luke tells us that Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And three times he predicts what's going to happen to him there. I thought it would be helpful to kind of review. In Luke 9.22 he says... This is Jesus. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And again in Luke 9, verse 44, Jesus says, Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. And then his third prediction. His disciples, it says, they just didn't understand what Jesus meant when he was saying this. But in Luke 18, 31 to 33, he says, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, insult him, spit on him. They will flog him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. So Jesus is a man on a mission, and nothing or no one was going to stop him. We've learned that along his journey to Jerusalem, Jesus was gaining popularity all along the way as he was healing the sick, as he was feeding thousands of people. He was casting out demons. He was raising people from death to life. And he is always being tested by the religious leaders of the day who are feeling quite threatened by what Jesus is teaching. He's challenging their understanding of who's in and who's out when it comes to God's kingdom. And he's dismantling their strict religious system. So we've already covered two parables that we found in Luke chapter 18. The persistent widow, if you remember that one, and the Pharisee and the tax collector. Both having to do with prayer. But now we're going to take a look at the camel and the needle. I'm going to pray first and then we'll read the passage found in Luke 18. Let's pray. Father, we can't understand your word without your Holy Spirit. Um, we pray, Father, that you would open our eyes and our hearts and our ears so that we can understand your word today and that we can apply it to our lives, Lord, that we'll be not just hearers, but we'll be doers as well of your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you have your Bibles with you or your Bibles in app, thor app form, or you can even watch along the screen, I have some slides there for you. We're going to jump right in. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. 
Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. God always blesses the reading of his word. So I just want to unpack this passage for us and see what God has for us today. First, you'll note that it says a certain ruler, a certain ruler who approaches Jesus. And we know that the disciples are listening in and likely there are others in the crowd as well. Some speculate that this ruler was a leader in the synagogue and he had some sort of administrative authority. And notice how he addresses Jesus. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asks him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So he calls Jesus good teacher, which is a very rare greeting apparently. And in fact, Bailey notes that this ruler is really overdoing it. He's laying it on thick. He's trying too hard by calling Jesus good teacher. He's trying really hard to impress Jesus with a compliment. And he's likely hoping to receive a compliment in return. We do that, don't we? Hey, nice clothes. Yeah, yeah, you've got a nice outfit too. Like we're always looking for compliments, it seems. But apparently this was a cultural expectation in that if I compliment you, then you return the favor. He was likely expecting Jesus to reply, Oh, respected and noble ruler. But, of course, Jesus being Jesus, he doesn't follow the social pleasantries. Once again, as in other stories, he is testing the motivations of this ruler. He sees behind the false compliment and instead challenges him by asking, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. In other words, good is applied only to God. Are you really applying this title to me? And the question is left unanswered. We discover that the rich young ruler is looking for a to-do list. How many here like to-do lists? Oh yeah, we got a lot of list people here. He's looking for a to-do list in order to inherit eternal life. What must I do? He asks Jesus, and Jesus points the young man to the Ten Commandments, the to-dos of God's people. And he notes specifically the commands highlighting how God's people are to behave toward one another. Faithfulness to the spouse. Don't murder, seems clear. Don't steal from others. Don't lie or slander others. And honor your parents. I like that last one. I like that. But notice the order is changed. If you go back, maybe you'll do this this afternoon before you have your Sunday afternoon nap. Go back into Exodus 20, where it says, Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. And you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Notice the order is changed up here. Of course, this reordering of these commands is definitely on purpose because it's Jesus, right? He's always got a purpose. He's always got a a method Jesus is highlighting the importance of loyalty to the family and of owning property in the ancient Middle Eastern culture. In fact, loyalty to family is both the first and the last of the commands that Jesus highlights, just like bookends, faithfulness to the spouse and honoring your parents, loyalty to your family. So the ruler affirms that he's kept all those. I'm good. In fact, Since he was a boy, he's kept them all. Check, check, check. He must be feeling really hopeful at this point. 
You can imagine, yeah, I'm faithful to my wife. I haven't killed anyone, for heaven's sakes. I haven't stolen anyone's property. I haven't told lies about my neighbor. And of course, I respect and honor my mom and my dad. In fact, I'm committed to taking care of them until the day that they die and see that they have a proper burial as was, uh, as was expected in this culture. He's saying, check, 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 I'm in. Yay! And the crowd is going wild. Actually not. Wait for it. What is Jesus' response? You'd think he'd say, way to go! I'm so proud of you. You're in, you're in like Flynn. No, he's not concerned with the externals. Jesus is concerned with the heart. What's going on inside? And reveals the rich ruler's real problem. You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Jesus is challenging the cultural values again. Those things that are considered number one for a first century Jew. He challenges his loyalty to property and wealth. Indeed, his family estate when he says sell everything. And his loyalty to family, leaving his father and mother when Jesus says, come follow me. Do these things and then he'll have treasure in heaven. In other words, eternal life. So Jesus tells the young ruler that he is lacking one thing. He has misplaced his loyalty and his devotion. Jesus is calling him to a radical loyalty and devotion to him above his property and his family. And Bailey compares this challenge to what God called Abraham to do, to leave his home, to leave his property, and called him to a radical loyalty to God versus his family. And of course, Abraham proved his loyalty, and he obeyed God, and he followed him. So what is this wealthy man's response? Yay, okay, whatever you say, Jesus, I'll sell it all. I'll tell my parents I'm out of here. Hope someone can bury you when you're gone. So I can follow you. Nope. He says he became very sad because he was wealthy. And perhaps he's not just sad over the demand to sell everything, not just sad because of his love of wealth. Maybe he's sad as well because Jesus is pointing out to him that there is indeed nothing he can do to inherit eternal life. It's way beyond following the commands in God's law. It's far, far more. And Jesus knows that with wealth can bring this sense of pride and self-sufficiency. It can produce that sense of accomplishment, of being a self-made person, and being admired in the eyes of the culture. But you see, status in God's eyes has nothing to do with our social standing. The only way to achieve status cannot be earned, but it is humbly received, Jesus says, as a gift. So the ruler grieves. Grieves the potential loss of all that is valuable to him, his family estate and the loss of his family in order to follow Jesus, and it proves too much for him. And Jesus looks at him and says this, and this is the parable. This is the parable. Verses 24 and 25. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So some speculate, it's quite interesting, that the word for camel means a thick rope. That it's impossible to pull a thick rope through the eye of a sewing needle. I have a hard time just putting regular thread through an eye of a needle, let alone a thick rope. It's almost impossible. Others say that the term camel means a large beam that supports a roof. So there's two speculations. But most agree that Jesus is referring to the large four-legged animal called a camel. It's literal. And some speculate that the eye of the needle is referring to a large double doors that open from the street to the courtyard of the family home. They were constructed tall enough and wide enough to allow a fully loaded camel to come on through. And again, most scholars say there's really no evidence that this is the proper interpretation. And I like what Bailey says here. He says, the elephant was the largest animal in Mesopotamia and the camel was the largest in Palestine. In each case, we are illustrating something that is quite impossible. 
as the text itself affirms, the camel needle parable is to be taken literally. I find that interesting. So Jesus is saying to this man, you know, relying on your wealth or your possessions or your family, your heritage to enter God's kingdom is impossible. You can't do it. He might want to earn his way, but that's not how it works. And the only way is through the grace of God, a gift that he receives and cannot earn. And I love the response of the crowd. Who then can be saved? This guy is rich. He's probably done some good things with his wealth in the community. Wealth and prosperity were a sign of God's favor. He probably, if this ruler who is wealthy and who we see having God's favor, if he's not saved, then who among us is or can be? But Jesus points to this parable, the impossible scenario of a camel going through the eye of a needle to what is only possible with God. The ruler finds this all too hard, and the crowd echoes this as well as they ask, who can be saved? And Jesus is like, I'm so glad you asked. It's impossible with people, and only possible with God. And only he can perform the miracle that it would take even for a wealthy person to enter into the kingdom. And then we see Peter, love Peter, right? Peter, who's hearing all of this, and he turns to Jesus, and he tells him, hey, we've left everything to follow you. They've actually left more than their possessions. They've left their families, their property. They've left people, exactly what the rich man just couldn't do. And the cultural pressures were upon them as well, but then a miracle happened. Listen to this. What was impossible with men was demonstrated as possible by God in their own concrete discipleship. Indeed, men and women of faith in every age discover that the impossible demands of obedience are made possible through the miracle of God's grace. Jesus says to Peter, no one who's left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. He is calling this rich ruler to do something that is humanly impossible given the pressures of the culture. The disciples, however, have broken with the cultural expectations and loyalties in order to follow Jesus. And as a result, Jesus said that not only will they fail to receive, not fail to receive, not earn, but to receive many times as much in this age, that's in this life and in the future, eternal life. No one who responds to the call of obedience will be left out. So let's be clear, though. I think this passage sometimes could be misinterpreted. Jesus doesn't mean that we should leave our spouses and our marriages. I bet you Dave's relieved. <laughs> Maybe not. Break ties with our families. He means that our faith in God and our relationship to him is the number one priority. Number one. And doing what he calls us to do is first and foremost we get cultural pressures. We get family pressures. Expectations of us, real or imagined. And they can take precedence over what God is actually calling us to do and to be. So what is that one thing for you? If Jesus were standing here right now, looking at your life, what would he say you lack? What would he say I lack. Maybe you haven't even taken the step of faith and invited Jesus to be part of your life. Can I encourage you today to receive him? Receive him. Because when you do, a reordering of your priorities happens. You begin to see things through his eyes. You begin to value what he values and what really matters in life. And guess what that is? It's people before things. We're all confused. We think it's things first, and then our relationships we don't really invest in. People matter to God. You matter to God. Your neighbor matters to God. 
The person in the checkout counter matters to God. And he wants us, what, he, what matters to him, to matter to us. And as a church, we are called now more than ever to show his love and grace and mercy towards others. People before things. One author writes, you can have everything this age has to offer. But without Jesus, you still lack the one thing that matters most. If you gain the whole universe and have not Jesus, you are infinitely impoverished compared to the one who has the treasure. Now, just stay with me here. Are you still with me? You can say yes. Wonderful. Just imagine for a moment that you and I are in conversation with Jesus, just like the rich young ruler. And you say to him, you know what, Jesus? I've put my faith and trust in you. Maybe recently or maybe years ago, I've been following you. I've encountered you in a personal way. I've believed you died on the cross for me. And three days later, you rose again. I believe in that gospel message. And you assure me that your presence is with me now and that ultimately eternity is secured. Thank you. But today, he's calling you and he's calling me to a radical obedience in an area of your life that maybe you have elevated higher than him, that has become more important to you. He says to you and to me, I'm so glad you've received by faith the love and forgiveness that my life, death, and resurrection have secured for you and have provided, but you still lack one thing. What would that be for you, for me? Because he's rooting out all of those things. You know, I remember somebody said the heart is like an idol factory, right? We just always got these things that we worship instead of Jesus. Those misplaced loyalties we have in our lives, those people are things that we would be so sad, we'd be grieved to give up or leave behind if he asked us to in response to a call on on our lives. So I just want to take a moment right now and I'd like us just to ask God to reveal to us what that one thing is. That one thing that we lack. Maybe we're still putting our faith and trust in our good works, you know, that it's up to us to earn our way, that we behave our way into God's acceptance. And we know that that's a lie. We've learned that today from this parable. Jesus clearly tells us, that we can't do anything to earn his acceptance. It's about what he's done for us and we humbly receive it. But maybe it's our wealth that we have been trusting, that career, that house, those things, stuff mart. Maybe the one thing you and I lack is the growth of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Maybe Jesus is saying the one thing you lack is love, my kind of love, the other-centered love. Maybe it's your joy. Maybe it's your peace in an age of great worries and anxiety. Maybe it's patience, kindness, or goodness. Maybe it's gentleness or self-control in an area of your life that you or I have not surrendered to God. These are only made possible by the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't possibly grow these on our own. It's not about us trying. He wants to reorder our priorities, putting him first ahead of our spouse, ahead of our family, and ahead of our possessions. This is, who, this is hard teaching. Can you say yes? You might think this is impossible. Well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's impossible. What's impossible for us to do with God is possible. Let's pray. Jesus, you're asking us to reorder our lives. You know, for this young ruler, his loyalty and his security was found in his wealth, in his possessions, his riches, his family. God, it had become the central place of his safety and his security Lord, would you please help us to reorder those things that have taken first place in our lives? Help us to put you first. May you be on the throne of our hearts. Help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and then you say all these things will be given to us as well. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your acceptance of us, God. 
And it's not because of anything that we've done, but it's because what you have done. We are grateful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.